Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. We begin tonight with a call to action. Tomorrow is World Blood Donor Day, and it is dedicated to raising awareness about giving blood and to thank donors for their life-saving gift. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says tomorrow also carries a deeper meaning as our local need for blood right here is currently outpacing donations. The night team's Tiffany Huertas explains the simple ways you can help save lives in your own community. We're at about 1.5 days, a one and a half day supply of blood. Um, and we like to be at at least three days of supply. Adrian Mendoza with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says there are many reasons why blood demand is up. We've seen as much as 20% increase in the need for blood because people are going back into the hospital after having delayed surgeries and also our community has grown over this last year. While blood donations help patients going through treatments and those involved in accidents, Mendoza says it's critical during tragedies like the one that happened in Austin this weekend. We had the mass shooting over the weekend in Austin and that really concerned us because we are so critical and really not able to effectively meet the needs of the community right now. Mendoza hopes people come out and donate for World Blood Donor Day tomorrow. You may not know the person who receives the blood you give, but you know you're making an impact and you're giving back to the community and helping someone who truly does need it. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. One of the locations you can donate tomorrow, William J. Brennan High School. Donations will be accepted from 1 to 6 p.m. To schedule an appointment, call 210-731-5590 or head to SouthTexasBlood.org. New on the night beat, one of the 14 victims of yesterday's mass shooting up in Austin has died. Austin police confirm 25-year-old Douglas John Cantor, who was a tourist visiting from New York, died in the hospital around noon today. News of uh, Cantor's death came just after Austin police confirmed they had arrested a juvenile suspect in that shooting. At last update, that person has not yet been charged. Police are still looking for the second suspect involved in the shooting, which happened around 1.30 a.m. on Austin's 6th Street Bar District. We know both suspects are male. What is still unclear is whether they both fired guns in this incident. Of the 13 other injured, 12 are reported stable. One more critical. Authorities believe the shooting stemmed from an argument. Here at home, a 23-year-old man is dead after police say he was shot at a large party on the south side overnight. It happened around 3.30 a.m. on Loop 410 South Access Road between Somerset and Highway 16. By the time officers got there, they saw several vehicles trying to leave what they say is a large ranch-like property. The man who was killed was found on a dirt road about a half a mile from the access road. The man's friend, the only one who stayed at the scene when officers got there. He told police he was walking behind his friend when he heard gunshots and saw he'd been hit. Right now, police say they do not have any suspects. Tonight, Seguin police say they have one armed robbery suspect in custody and they're still searching for his accomplice. 37-year-old at Seiko Factor turned himself in today. Police say he's accused of robbing two pharmacies in Pleasanton. Still on the run tonight, 38-year-old Andrew Jack, he's seen here. He's accused in both of those robberies with Factor, along with two other robberies in Seguin. Anyone with information about his whereabouts urged to call the Guadalupe County Crime Stoppers at the number there on your screen, 877-403-8477. Turning now to coronavirus news, a federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit filed by hospital staff in Houston who refused to get vaccinated for COVID-19. More than 100 employees sued Houston Methodist Hospital because it's requiring all employees to be vaccinated or face a risk of suspension or termination. The lawsuit said the mandate goes too far and violates personal autonomy, calling the vaccines, quote, experimental and dangerous. The judge agreed with the hospital that their claims about the vaccine are untrue. The judge also strongly objected to the lawsuit's argument comparing the vaccine to forced experimentation during the Holocaust, calling it reprehensible. An appeal from the plaintiffs is expected. Concerns over the highly contagious Delta COVID variant are growing here in the U.S. This variant accounting for an increasing number of cases, making the push to get people vaccinated even more urgent. This is we've reached nearly 600,000 dead from the virus here in the U.S. The Delta variant was first identified in India. It is now estimated to make up 6% of the cases in the United States. 
That's what this virus does. It keeps mutating and becoming more contagious. As it gets more contagious, you need a higher percentage of the population to be vaccinated to stop spread. The good news on the whole, COVID cases are declining here in the U.S. and states like California and New York will soon be dropping all of their COVID restrictions. Outside with live cam, still in the 80s at this hour. It's been a hot weekend and that's going to continue in the week ahead. We do have a couple of low end rain chances to sprinkle in over the next few days, but for the most part, the heat will continue to take center stage in our forecast. Today's almanac for San Antonio, 75 our morning low up to 95 this afternoon. Felt more like 100, 101 for a few hours when you factor in the humidity. So 84 at the airport right now, mostly clear skies, not much wind out there at all. And winds will be light overnight. This sets us up for a really, really muggy start to the day tomorrow. And of course, it'll be hot again tomorrow afternoon. We'll talk more about what you can expect in the week ahead and also check on what's going on in the tropics coming up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Well, it is Pride Month and San Antonio has a lot to be proud of. The San Antonio Pride Softball League is heading to the World Series. And while they say their goal is to, pro to provide an outlet of support for the San Antonio LGBTQ plus community, they also want to bring home the win. The night team's Jonathan Cotto spent the day with the team who say softball is life and the rest is just details. Hector Barrera is the San Antonio Pride Softball League's commissioner, coach, and player. He says he's looking to put San Antonio's gay community on the map. They're putting in the work and preparing to represent San Antonio at the national level. They'll be heading to the North American Gay Amateur Athletic Alliance World Series. It's a week-long tournament. Um, it's a lot different than just a weekend. You know, it's it's you're playing 10, 15 games or more in, in a week. So it's... Um, pretty good show of endurance as well. The league celebrated its very first game back in 2015. It was formed to serve as an outlet for everyone looking to support the LGBTQ community. Alexander Wayne Scott is an outfielder for the league and picked up the sport just four years ago. He says growing up, he's always wanted to be on a team, but never felt he would fit in. I mean, we all have a, a similar uh, background. I think that's the biggest thing when it comes to that morale of the team. So. Um, no matter what, we're just there to support each other. For these players, it's about advocating for their community, inclusiveness and equality. But at the end of the day, it's also about the game. And most importantly, it's about winning. Daniel Gutierrez is a fierce competitor on and off the field. who grew up playing softball. He says there is more that unites us than separates us and adds differences should be celebrated, not discriminated. When you're out here, you're a ball player. Oh, you don't care. The way my dad raised me to play, you're a ball player on the field. You're not, no gender, no sexual orientation, nothing. You get out there, you're a ball player. End of discussion. The World Series will be taking place in Columbus, Ohio at the end of August, and the team says they don't underestimate what they can bring to the plate. If we, do we get lower than 10th place? I'm holding uh, Hector personally responsible. Hector's personally responsible we get less than anything lower than 10th place because we're a good team. We're a very good team. We're going we're gonna to do very well out there. I know we are. I am confident in that. <laughs> Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And we wish them the best of luck. The North American Gay Amateur Athletic Alliance has more than 17,000 players from 46 cities across Canada and the U.S. So the San Antonio Pride League will be up against the best teams competing at the Gay Softball World Series. For more details, head to our website, ksat.com. A new episode of KSAT Explains will be out Tuesday night, and this week's show is all about an iconic bar and dance club that opened back in 1981 and the tremendous history behind it. Myra Arthur has a preview. In the heart of downtown San Antonio, there's a nightclub that's been a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community for the past 40 years. It's on the backside of the Alamo the Texas Cradle of Liberty. Generations of San Antonians have become familiar with the Bonham Exchange. Seeing the lights and the, the multiple rooms and the music blaring and, you know, everybody just laughing and having a good time. And it was just like, I was at home. I think that this is just, it's a place that you can just let go, cut loose, dance all night. From the drag shows to the dance floor, the Bonham is a San Antonio staple where all are welcome. Everybody that goes there knows what to expect and they embrace it with open arms. Here, we're a love everybody. We're 
live and let live kind of place. We're a gay bar that welcomes everybody. But the Bonham is more than just a place for a fun night out. Baked into the building's walls is a wealth of history. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're taking a look at that history and the legacy of the Bonham Exchange and the man who started it all. Still ahead on the night beat, it was an eventful day for President Biden, who's traveling abroad from the G7 summit to tea with the Queen Elizabeth. A look back at today and what's next on his agenda. Plus, a local police officer hoping to both honor a fallen friend and change the lives of local teens by getting them involved in sports. What's up, South Texas is back tonight. And we bring you an inside a virtual reality training session for law enforcement officers all over Texas. We'll tell you which local department requested the training and why they think it's so necessary. Judgment training, force option training, street smarts VR. It goes by many names, but what it is, is an innovative and technologically advanced way for law enforcement officers to practice intense real life scenarios. We got to be flies on the wall as Balcones Heights police officers went through the virtual reality simulations. They told me why they think it's a crucial tool. Police, you all right? Police department, get out of the way. Police. Okay, good. What you see is Balcones Heights Police Sergeant Robert Dominguez at the department doing a virtual reality active shooter training. This is what he sees, a simulated 3D world where the threats and decisions seem very real. Because our job is to what? You Eliminate said, the threat. Right. Correct. Stop the killing, right? Correct. So you got in there and... Uh, and neutralize the threat. Good job. The trainer with Sergeant Dominguez is from the Texas Municipal Police Association, or TMPA. So we got the virtual reality system uh, about probably three weeks pre-COVID uh, last year. Officers are put through a variety of scenarios, and it's as close to a real world situation that we can get them into. TMPA training coordinator Brian Flat says Balcones Heights Police Chief John Jahanara requested the training. We have a lot of officers who are a young department where this is their first law enforcement job. So in maybe just getting that experience and that uh, critique. The system includes a virtual reality headset with audio, and they also have access to a taser, rifle, and pistol. And it's not just active shooter training like you've seen officers do before. Females called in and advised that her adult daughter and her daughter's fiance who live with her are fighting in the back room. She's worried about her daughter's safety. Police department, where are they at? You okay, ma'am? Hey, man, go ahead and step to the side. Hey, step to the side. Hey, step to the side. Hey, you need to settle down. All right, good. After each simulation, the trainer checks out the full version of what the officer saw. Then it's time for a critique. Anything you would have done different? I would have announced myself even louder. The suspect picked up a lamp and right threw it at you. Correct. What do you consider a lamp to be as it's being hurled at you? Uh, it could be used as a deadly weapon. Sure. And you deployed the taser at that point? Correct. Why? I didn't, I didn't feel the need to shoot him at that point. Um, if now had the taser not incapacitated him, I would have, he would have reached for the bat or something else, then we have gone to the next level of force but in that case my, my my threat level is a little bit lower with the lamp i think that was completely appropriate the simulated issues are real and common like that domestic violence incident or a mental health call mom has called and advised that her schizophrenic son who is off this medication is acting very erratically and not following directions good ma'am how about yourself is this your son hey james what do you do with that screwdriver can you put that screwdriver down can he come talk to me, James? In this simulation, Sergeant Dominguez is able to talk the man into putting down the weapon. Distance equals time. You give yourself some distance, you have time to react, you have time to de-escalate the situation. Um, it opens more options. It's about the uh, education, the experience of the officer. Can they calm themselves down? Well, I've never been through a situation like that. Uh, it was awesome. I think it's really good training. Totally exposes your def deficiencies, where your tactical deficiencies, your verbal deficiencies, uh, how to encounter. Uh, if you can make a mistake, this is the place to do it. 
And this training is also available to the public. So if you work for a public entity, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy group, or anything, you can contact TMPA to set up a training. It's been a while since I've done a shoot, don't shoot scenario with yes. local law enforcement. It has totally gone high tech there. It really has, and it's incredible. They're peddling this around Texas, and so they've gone to about 10 places so far. Oh, good training. Yeah. Meanwhile, we are still a few days from summer, but it yeah. already feels like summer here, but we know <laughs> it can get much hotter. Uh, that is true, and I know it's hard to believe that we're still a week away from the official start of summer but here in texas we get a jump on things a little bit early in that department yeah the summer solstice is not until next sunday night at 10 30 so our first full day of summer won't be until a week from tomorrow so it's coming sunday june 20th the official start to the summer season what did begin officially on June 1st is hurricane season and we're going to start off with talking about what's going on in the tropics looking here at the Bay of Campeche the Yucatan Peninsula just off to the west here not very impressive right where you see these areas of red that's some nice convection basically just shower and thunderstorm activity and right here in the Bay of Campeche really not very impressive but this is actually an area of disturbed weather, basically just a complex of some shower and thunderstorm activity that the National Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on. And it has uh, the Hurricane Center has given this area here a 50% chance of development in the next five days. What does that mean? Well, that means this system here has a 50% chance over the next five days of organizing itself enough that it could become a tropical depression, potentially a tropical storm. This is going to slowly move off to the north, closer to the Gulf of Mexico over the next several days. So all this deep tropical moisture, very high moisture content, which basically just means uh, the potential for some heavier rain. This is gonna slowly drift north through the end of the week. This is Friday, 10 p.m. So this is gonna take its time working into the Gulf of Mexico. So we've got several more days to watch this moisture, see if it can organize itself to potentially become a tropical depression, maybe a tropical storm. All indications are that by the end of the week into the start of next weekend, the bulk of this deep tropical moisture, so the potential for rain, is going to stay east of our area and potentially affect the far eastern Texas coast into Louisiana. So right now, I don't have any changes to our weather forecast for the end of this week and start of next week. And of course, we'll keep a very close eye on it for you. Speaking of hurricane season, have you checked out the list of names for this year? We actually already used up Anna, uh, but don't worry for all you Disney fans, Elsa's down the list there. It's it's E. Um, always like to show this off so that you can, you know, maybe tag your family or, or friends, their name made the list this year. At the airport now 84, but with that dew point of 72, it still feels like 90 even at this hour. So still nice and toasty out there. Air temperature is still in the 90s. In Del Rio, you're at 93. It's 81 in Rock Springs. Our dew points are uh, pretty much sky high across the board. 60s in some spots, but for the most of us, 70s, and so it's feeling really muggy, and we don't even have much of a breeze to help us out tonight. Looking at satellite and radar, awfully quiet out there. There were a couple of showers near Houston this afternoon, uh, but they stayed well off to our east, and now skies are mostly clear, and it's going to be a pretty quiet night. I do expect we'll pull in a couple of clouds through early tomorrow morning. Light winds overnight, really muggy to start the day tomorrow with temperatures in the mid to upper 70s. As we get into tomorrow afternoon, We'll keep an eye on radar. There could be a couple of really, really spotty showers and a, maybe a non-severe thunderstorm that try to bubble up. We'll keep a close eye on that. Most of us, though, will just be stuck with the heat again tomorrow. Your highs will be back in the mid-90s, uh, triple digits off to the south and to the west. We'll talk more about these low-end rain chances over the next couple of days coming up next half hour. Guys. The only encouraging thing about that list is Anna and Elsa makes me feel like thinking about Frozen during the summer. <laughs> I feel like they, if there was a Hurricane Tim, it would be pretty destructive. So. It's, he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> we don't need a real one. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> Five years after the devastating mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, the community is still healing there. How they honored those that we lost this weekend. Coming up at 1030 after a preview of Instant Replay. That's next. San Antonio Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond is up for two NBA head coaching vacancies in the NBA. Is this the offseason Becky makes history again? With more on that and what's on Instant Replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg. Sanders. I got a feeling this is her offseason yeah. to get that 
head coaching job. And San Antonio's Pato Award wins his second IndyCar race today in Detroit with a finish you have to see to believe. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Becky Hammond is being interviewed for two head coaching vacancies in the NBA and maybe more before the week is out. She's already made history becoming the first full-time assistant coach in the NBA as a woman. Now we wait to see if she makes even more history for women in sports. Oh, good. Yeah, after a hard-fought finish, San Antonio's own Pato Award celebrates in the fountain of the Detroit Grand Prix. The winning race two today, his second IndyCar victory this year following his first in Texas last month. And wait until you see what he's able to do to take the checkered flag. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, I'm not giving up this belt. And what is it like to be San Antonio world champion Mario Barrios before he steps into the ring on June the 26th to defend his title? Showtime All Access shows you as cameras follow his every move in his final days of training for his main event against Gervonta Davis. All that plus, do you believe Becky Hammond will land a head coaching job in the NBA this offseason? Tonight, you decide. Instant Replay is live and it's after the night. Being like I say, I got a feeling this is her year. Time to break some glass. You got it. Thank you, Greg. We'll see you on the other side with more on the night beat. Welcome back. After the conclusion of the G7 summit in Cornwall, President Biden traveled to Brussels, where he will meet with NATO leaders before his upcoming summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday in Geneva, Switzerland. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Amdi with the details. President Biden arriving in Brussels on Sunday after wrapping up the G7 summit in Cornwall, England. I think we've made some progress in reestablishing American credibility. The G7 leaders offering a united front on a global plan to end the pandemic and fight climate change. But their plans to counter China's growing influence met with skepticism from the Chinese embassy, which says in a statement, quote, the days when global decisions were dictated by a small group of countries are long gone. Before leaving the UK, the president and first lady met with Queen Elizabeth for tea at Windsor Castle. Biden describing the queen as extremely gracious, inviting her majesty to the White House. Reminded me of my mother. In terms of the, the look of her and, the, you know, just the generosity. The latest ABC News Ipsos poll finds a majority of Americans, 52 percent, have a great deal or a good amount of trust in the president to negotiate with world leaders. Meantime, 49 percent have a great or good amount of trust in Biden to negotiate with Russian President Vladimir Putin. On Wednesday, all eyes will be on Geneva as the two leaders meet. We're not looking for conflict. We are looking to resolve those actions which we think are inconsistent with international norms. Putin has said relations between the two countries are at a low point. Let me make it clear. I think he's right. It's a low point. The president said on Sunday he hopes to find areas where the two countries can work together. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. This weekend, we're remembering the 49 people lost five years ago during the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. That city hosting a remembrance week this past week, culminating with what's become known as Orlando United Day, which was yesterday. A final event was held for survivors, families and first responders at the Pulse Interim Memorial. Nadine Yanes with our sister station WKMG in Orlando was there and brings us some of their stories. Luis Daniel Rosaleo Dani. As the names are being read aloud, streamed on a screen from Pulse just blocks away, at least 1,500 people watched in silence at DPAC. Alejandro Barrios Martinez. Many while wiping tears. Craig Adcock and his group clapped for his friend, Edward Sotomayor Jr. When his name came up today. A flood of emotions. I miss him so much. And um, it was just t so touching how the community came together to remember all the lives lost in my friend. And I remember where I was that day when they read the names and he was the fourth name to come out. And I just collapsed on my couch. I could not believe it. Back on the same lawn where he stood five years ago. Every year I, I come with my friends every year to remember. I'm here because this is my hometown. I'm queer and non-binary myself. I remember seeing how many people were here those years ago and returning back and seeing so many people within our community is a good reminder that we're all still here, we're all still working for the same thing. And still holding on to that light as the community continues to heal. There's just as much solidarity, if not a ton more. It's, it's hard, but you know, I know that the community has our back. 
Hope you had a good weekend. Taking a look outside with live cam. Just a couple of clouds, still mostly clear for the time being, but with that high humidity, it's been hard for our temperatures to drop off in the evenings. We're still in the mid 80s right now after topping off at 95 this afternoon. And the heat and humidity are hanging around. We'll see our afternoon highs stay generally right near 95 all through the week. And we will carry a low end chance for an afternoon shower or non severe storm through about the middle of the week. We'll talk more about that and get you another look at your full forecast coming up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. He's using his position as a police officer to prevent kids from getting into trouble by playing sports. What's up South Texas is right after the break. He is part of a team of San Antonio police officers who help keep children out of trouble through sports. His name is Officer Julio Cavazos, and he's next on What's Up South Texas. He tells the night team's Jaffney Gray why helping the community is personal for him. We are inner city officers working with inner city kids. What I say, right? What? I say you're gonna keep them? Anything that I could keep these kids engaged in outside school activities besides drugs, violence. Ah. This is San Antonio police officer Julio Cavazos. During the pandemic, he became active with the department's Powell program or the Police Athletic League. The program was established in 1990 to help kids stay out of trouble. Julio helps kids with baseball, football, CrossFit, boxing, and even esports. There's a reason why he's yes. passionate about building yes. a relationship with the underserved youth on the West Side. Growing up in this neighborhood, I had a uh, lot of distrust for the police. Um, my parents had a lot of distrust for the police. Julio never thought he would ever become a part of the police department, but he changed his mind after his friends convinced him to give it a try. My dad came home and he saw the cadet uniform and he said, yes, sir. And my mom said, do we hope que ser policia? And he was, ah. Slowly but surely, his parents saw him grow into a man through the department. And then he met his partner, Officer Miguel Moreno, who also grew up on the West Side. He had, he had this mannerisms of him that I miss. And he uh, would poke at me <clears throat> to uh, better myself. At age 32, Miguel was killed when he and Julio were shot while investigating vehicle burglaries July 29th, 2017. While in the hospital with two gunshot wounds, Julio made Miguel a promise. I would keep, keep him alive some way um, and have people learn from it. He's doing just that, bridging the gap between law enforcement and the community through the PAL program. We're not guns and badges. We're, we're people from the neighborhood. We're, we're not cops and robbers. We're, we're friends. We could stand on equal footing and we could see each other. Hey, Coach, you mind if I get you on video? He was the, uh, the better man. And why I'm still here, I don't know. But I don't want people to forget him. For What's Up South Texas, I'm Jaffney Gray. Ah, what Community policing at its finest. Thank you, sir. The heat is here, and many of us are already cooling off in our home or neighborhood pools or even hitting the rivers. As the summer fun ramps up, it is important to know some basic swimming skills as they could save your life. More information on that next. Swim safety and your kids. Every year in the U.S., nearly 400 children under the age of 15 drown. And now there are concerns those numbers could be even worse because of the pandemic. Kids swim lessons were shut down last year and a lot of people put in new pools. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz on how basic skills can save a life. For seven-year-old Francine, swimming is just fun. It's also a skill that could save her life. And stop. I think that it's something that all children should know how to do. Right. Time for the treasure dive. But last year, swim lessons here at the YMCA and elsewhere were canceled, creating a pandemic gap that consumer advocates say could increase drowning risk this summer. Last year in Texas alone, 80 children drowned. And not even into summer this year, 25 young lives have been lost. Drowning is the leading cause of accidental death for kids under the age of five. It's important for even small kids to learn basic skills. Swimming is a survival skill. <laughs> YMCA Aquatics Director Director Crystal Vega says three so basics can be life-saving for a child who ends up in trouble. First, learning to be comfortable oh, underwater. Roll over. Next, learning to roll to yes, a back float and roll again to swim. And third, 
many different drowning and near drownings happen within five to six feet of assistance or the wall. So that's why we're teaching kids how to jump in and push off the bottom and get back to the side. Water lessons apply to adults too. Avoid distractions and appoint a water watcher to keep eyes on the kids at all times. It can take as little as 10 seconds for a child to go from distress to under the water and 10 seconds can be in the in a blink of an eye. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Kick, 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 kick. If there was ever a, a day. I was just to thinking how pool. refreshing that story looked. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> it's ever a day to be in the pool. It would have been today. Pool weather is here in full force and oh, I, yes. you know, it's, you know, it's going to hang around. Um, really been interesting lately to show the high temperature map across the country. Of course, we typically find ourselves one of the hotter spots. 95 are high today, but look at Boise, Idaho up in the northwest. 97, 102 in Salt Lake City. Of course, that's typically pretty toasty from Vegas down to Phoenix, but the heat high is going to settle in over the West Coast over the next few days and create some record high temperatures off to the West. It'll still be hot here, uh, but we have not been pushing records lately. Our average high this time of year is 92. We got up to 95 today. Um, that's not out of, you know, not in crazy land for this time of year. 94, the high in Gonzales. Slightly lower dew points off to the west allow Del Rio your high temperature to shoot up to 103 this afternoon. As we head into this uh, upcoming week, our high temperatures are going to stay in the mid 90s. So we'll uh, be hovering right around 95 for the next several days, and that will put our heat index near 100, a couple of degrees above that for a few hours here or there. This is nothing we can't deal with. Just, of course, remember those heat safety tips. If your work keeps you outdoors, stay hydrated. That's the biggest thing and the best thing you can do for yourself. And like Marilyn just shared in that package, if you'll be cool enough by the pool, just keep a close eye on everybody. 84 now at the airport, so it's still warm out there. At 78, Uvalde, 93, even at this hour in Del Rio. Not much of a breeze to help us out. Calm winds from Gonzales up to New Braunfels. Uh, winds are about 5 to 10 miles per hour elsewhere. As far as any uh, cloud cover or rain goes, of course, no rain today. A few fair weather clouds. And across south and central Texas, things are quiet. There's a little complex of storms diving closer to the I-20 corridor in North Texas, and then it's also been a pretty active day across parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and now Louisiana with some thunderstorms there. A lot of that activity as it tries to move west overnight is really going to start to fizzle out. Maybe some rain in Far East Texas, but I'm going to keep our forecast overnight rain free. However, for the next couple of afternoons, we'll carry a low end chance for an isolated shower or non severe storm. So there goes the heat high building in over the West Coast, big time heat off to the West. But rotating around this heat high are these little pieces of rain making energy. These orange blobs here, those are going to continue to move in overhead for the next couple of days, mainly through the middle of the week. So pair that with our hot, steamy weather. We could see a couple of spotty pop up showers and storms for the next couple of afternoons. Coverage of any rain is going to be on the lower side and most of us will miss out. But I do think a few lucky yards could get a cooling little pop up shower or storm over the next couple of days. Here's tomorrow afternoon, 4 PM. As we head into late afternoon, early evening forecast models do indicate some little pop up showers and storms. Again, most of us will be missing out, but there will be the potential for a little bit of cooling rain tomorrow. And again, on Tuesday, notice as we get past lunchtime into the heat of the day, that's what these little pop up thunder showers thrive on the hot and humid air. So uh, we'll see some more pop up thunder showers likely into Tuesday and then a very similar setup Wednesday, and then that will taper off through the back half of the work week. So this is not impressive rain chances by any means, certainly nothing like what we were dealing with a couple of weeks ago. But at the very least, if you get one of these thunder showers, it will help cool you off if not just for a little bit because the heat is certainly hanging around. So again, highs uh, mid 90s for the next couple of days. Heat index will be up near 100 degrees. Just take it easy if you'll be outside uh, for extended periods of time. Father's Day next weekend. I forgot to put that on the seven day during the 530 show, but there it is next Sunday. It does look like it's going to be hot. Oh, yay, Tim. Shocker. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Yeah. A new pandemic era record set at the box office over the weekend will run down the top five movies in your weekend box office report next.
Cruella fell from third to fifth place this weekend with $6.7 million. The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It dropped from first place all the way to fourth with just over $10 million. It's really the rabbit story. I just wrote it down. Look, Dad, it's Peter Rabbit. Oh, uh, I hate that I'm the face of this. He's a little naughty. What? Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway, has been hopping all over the release calendar for more than a year. The bunny bounced to a third place debut with $10.4 million. Arriving just short of a year after its intended release, Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights bowed in second place on ticket sales of $11.4 million. A Quiet Place Part 2 rebounded back into first place after slipping to second, earning $11.6 million. That brings its three-week domestic box office total to $108.9 million, making it the first movie to break the $100 million mark since the pandemic began. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Who stood out at the Dallas Cowboys minicamp that led to an early release? Sorry, my chair just broke. And uh, the new head coach of the Houston Texans shocks everyone when he cancels their mandatory minicamp that was set to start this week. What's behind this? Let's find out with Greg Simmons, who you're lucky you're standing. So you, you know, look at my little baby chair. Those chairs <laughs> often do not work. And the funniest part about it is you just slowly start shaking. There's nothing you can do about it. Here we go. <laughs> Yep. And what Kellen Mond's father revealed when it came to San Antonio and former Aggies quarterback regarding the Texans coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. It's been great. Uh, it's great. I mean, it's just exciting, as I told you guys before, just to, to be back out there, man. Just to be back out there with my teammates, breaking a huddle, uh, throwing the ball. The Dallas Cowboys have two standouts at their organized team activities and their more recent minicamp who wowed the coaching staff that led to the team getting the last day off. And why in the world did new head coach of the Houston Texans cancel the mandatory minicamp slated to start this Tuesday? And what did Kellen Mond's father reveal about the former Reagan and Aggie quarterback during the draft when it comes to the Texans? Up 16 and they have frustrated Kevin Durant. A lot of contact, very physical. He's upset, he's frustrated. The Milwaukee Bucks get even with the Brooklyn Nets, turning their best of seven series into a best of three, but the Nets may be without one of their big three when their series resumes after what happened today. And it's time to grade the Spurs from Larry, myself, and including our viewers, you tonight. Who was your favorite and who needs to have some extra credit during this offseason? All that plus who wins the French Open Championship tonight. We will show you. Instant Replay is live and it's next. And I say we break the piggy bank and buy a couple more. <laughs> I have new chairs. I've been trying. Thank <laughs> you. Pregnant lady's about to fall over. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. A World War II veteran is recognized by her home state for her intelligence work. We're going to tell you something good next.